Okay, I'm going to start again. So I'm, I'm switching away from DO events and go to the glacial interglacial cycle. But do you have any questions on the, the DO events? No? Um, yeah, so there seem to be two mechanisms, right? One is related to the sea ice and the heat transport under the sea ice or something. And one is more about the, um, so the shut off of like the fresh water input um, and shutting down the lower trigger circulation. Yes. But they are somehow related to each other. So do you know what the leading idea is? What yeah. Like if you need both, or? Uh, I mean, do you need? So if you look at the, the literature, people definitely the, the AMOC is the leading. I would say it's the leading ID in the literature. Uh, if you look at those two examples I, I, I showed at the end, the Duncan paper and the, and the, the Vettori and Pelletier, uh, in in the Duncan paper there is. You could invoke a small change in the AMOC, but it's not fundamental to the, to the mechanism. Uh, in the Peltier, there is a big change in the AMOC. But again, it's not necessarily a, a building element. It may be more a symptom of what's going on rather than a, a, a now I think the debate is very much open. Uh, um, I'm, you know, they, they, are not in, they are not orthogonal. That's, that's one, one point to make. It's, they are not exclusive. Uh, I don't think at this point we have all the data for people making their mind. So I understood your message. The, the, the rapid warming was a result of the shutdown of the AMOC. That was a suggestion, yes. The, the analogy was. Uh, the analogy was that the shutdown of the AMOC mark could lead to the, the rapid warming at the end of the events. Uh, yes, on the first part of the talk. And you talked about the asymmetry, and you're, you're making the analogy, and you were saying that, uh, is that, is that the right conclusion? The, uh, the AMOC shut down then, because you had the asymmetry, you said that it shuts down and keeps going. Oh, you, uh, you mean in the, in the more classic way people think about it? Yeah, when you got the end there, you were talking about the, uh, the convection instead of about the, uh, when, when you go from cooling or warming. Oh, okay, this one doesn't really need the AMOC to change in strength. Right. Yeah, the, the asymmetry comes from the, 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 the depth of the ocean which is involved into the transition. So in one case, you have large, intense convection which makes the, the effective heat capacity in contact with the atmosphere to be large. In the other case, you don't. But in both cases, you have an AMOC which is substantial. It's not collapsed. Okay. So even if you're not forming heat convection, you're still... Well, you, still, you can still have some water mass transformation, yes, yeah. It, it's weaker, but uh, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if, Brian, you have the, the numbers in mind? Yeah. It's just that it wasn't, it wasn't a clear case of one is there and the other one there is not an AMOC. In both cases, you had... But could we say pretty categorically that there are two, in the literature, there are two main mechanisms that have been invoked um, that supporting multiple equilibrium. One is the freshwater flux idea of Stommel, which yep. Broca, uh, you know, uh, had latched onto. And Stommel and Broca are such hugely influential scientists that that's been the predominant um, paradigm, actually, in the Paleo literature. Yeah. But then there's a, an older piece of work due to Federico and Sellers, which is the ice albedo feedback, which was yep. going on in the, in, in the 60s. And that is the dominant mechanism that, that we are finding in, 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 in these models. In those, yeah. The AMOC is, it, so that's the switch. The AMOC is responding, but it's not the. Um, and, and playing a role in the time scales, but it's not the trigger of the, uh, it's, not, it's, not the it's not the mechanism. No, it's not the mechanism. You, you don't need a shutdown, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I would say that in the literature, there are very few examples. I'm not even sure I can find an example, except for those two recent papers where these CI's albedo feedbacks 
at least the coupling between a big ice cap and the ocean has been invoked for geo events. It's, I think it's a fairly recent idea. Any other questions? Glacial interglacial cycle? Okay, so, uh, so now I've shown you two examples of uh, uh, multiple state we had in a in very idealized configuration, which had only, well, no continents or just a very narrow continent. And that's an example of a simulation which has, in this case, two big continents. So the continents are now 40 degrees wide. Uh, they extend over the full depth of the ocean. So those yellow uh, patches. We call that boomerang we, because it sort of looks like a boomerang if you look at it from the, the, the North Pole. But uh, we haven't found a, a really sexier name than that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you have any suggestions, uh, you, you'll get credited for that. Uh, you won't get rich, but... Uh, 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 and so we have a small basin and a large basin that looks like an Atlantic and a Pacific, and there is a, a southern ocean which is zonally reentrant. So there is an ACC going around. There is no Antarctica. And uh, something really interesting in that in that uh, simulation is that you have an AMOC, meaning that there is an overturning circulation in the small basin, but there is none in the large basin. And we, we've analyzed why this is the case. It has to do with the precipitation pattern. I'm not going to go there uh, here. The important point is that that system has some very interesting similarities with the present day, the, well, the climate as we know it. Just a question. Do you have rivers? Yes. Well, runoff. If it rains over the ocean, over the land, it's, it's carried to the, to, the, to the ocean. Yes, yeah. Uh, and there is overland, you have a very simple scheme. So uh, if it snows, it builds up a snow cover, and there is a uh, water storage. Uh, and when the buckets are full, the water runs out to the ocean. It's very simple. What about the albedo over the land? So the, uh, the albedo is prescribed, prescribed, except when there is snow that falls on top, then it's the snow of the albedo that, that's... Uh, that's uh, the, the, the sensitivity of the albedo than the albedo. Oh, actually, that's, that's how we found those multiple states, is playing with the albedo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the system is sensitive to that, actually, yeah. quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we get two states. One is a, a cold state and one is a warm state. I, I haven't tried the snowball because in, in that context, it's not really interesting. Uh, what you see is that the, the warm state has a, an, an ice cap to the south pole. It's quite warm. Uh, there is very little sea ice at the, at the north pole. And then you have a cold state which has two big ice caps at the two poles. And again, they are stable. They, are, they exist for the same forcing, same parameter. They are just two realizations of the same dynamical system. Uh, you can. For example, the sea surface temperature between globally average between the two simulations differs by 10 degrees, the SST by 8 degrees, and uh, I'm going to come back to uh, uh, the atmospheric PCO2 in a minute. So why do we have those stable states? It's the same story as before. Uh, if you look at the oceanic transport in the warm and the cold states, so the warm is in red and the cold state is in blue, you get the same picture that there's lots of heat being pushed away from the equator into the mid-latitude. So released to the atmosphere around 40, 50 degrees of latitude. Uh, and so if you look at the North Atlantic, the North Northern Basin, you have a state with very little sea ice and then a state which extends all the way at the point where you have maximum convergence of heat, which is released to the atmosphere and is able to stop the progression of the sea ice. Uh, if you look at the southern hemisphere, it doesn't change much between the two states. So we think that the multiple state in that case is emerging from the northern hemisphere. And that's quite interesting because if you compare to the previous case where we had a symmetry between the two hemispheres, we have a system which is now not symmetric between the two hemispheres, and yet we still get multiple states. It's actually not zonally symmetric either. 
So the stable state can survive a slightly more complicated geometry than almost an aqua planet, which is uh, interesting. So a lot of what's going on here is, uh, I, I would like to make the case that those two states look a lot like the present day climate and the last glacial maximum. So the last glacial maximum is the state about 21,000 years ago where the, we get the coldest of the glacial state just before we left the last glacial maximum and drifted into the warm climate we know now. So this is a plot showing the overturning circulation in those two states, that's the red curves. Uh, and the arrows give you an indication of the direction of the flow. And uh, the shading in the background is showing the temperature. So not surprisingly, in the cold state, the most of the ocean is near freezing, minus 0.5, minus 1 degree. Uh, in the warm state, you get actually a quite warm uh, deep ocean, which is 8 degrees. And you can recognize the North Atlantic cell here, which is carrying heat between the southern and the northern hemisphere, which is uh, associated to the deep water formation in the small basin, uh, upwelling into the southern ocean. There's a bit of Antarctic bottom water. It's quite weak in the warm state. And as you switch to the cold state, you see that that cell is decreasing in intensity, and this cell is increasing in intensity. Uh, there are some interesting uh, points here. If you look at the, 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 the bottom water and the cold state, it's, it's near freezing. And we have observation that at the last glacial maximum, deep water were, bottom water were near the freezing point. The bottom water are saltier in the cold state than in warm state. And that's, that's simply because in the cold state, that cell is driven by brine rejection due to the expansion of the sea ice. There is, way more, there is a bit more sea ice in the southern hemisphere, and the growth of the sea ice means that there is more brine rejection and they get slightly saltier water being produced, more and slightly saltier water. Um, there is an interesting point here. It's, you can't really see it well on that plot, but if you look at how much water is coming up into the southern ocean up to the surface, it's actually not changing between the two simulations. The, the total amount rising to the surface is the, about the same. What's happening is that in this state, most of the water rising to the surface is being warmed up. It's gaining buoyancy. And in a steady state, if you get uh, uh, you gain buoyancy, You're, the water are transforming into lighter water and moving equatorward. In that state, most of the water coming up to the surface is rising in a place where it's losing buoyancy because it's now near the ice edge. And so it's transformed into denser water and turning into southward, into the, uh, the Antarctic bottom cell. So it's really a shift of how much the water go, going up goes north or south in between the two simulations. Uh, and that comes also with a, you, it's, it's tough to see, but uh, on this plot, the boundary between the two, the two cells is moving upward in that cold state. And again, it's something to do with, uh, which is related to observation. And uh, just to point out that what's happening in there seems to be extremely similar to what has been uh, described in, in, the, in that Watson et al. paper. Uh, essentially, what happens in that coupled system is that the buoyancy flux at the surface in the southern ocean are changed in between the warm and the cold state. The winds are very similar, but the, the buoyancy forcing which changes. And really, it's about water coming up and either being transformed into lighter or denser water and the change in the buoyancy flux in that system has led to a buoyancy loss which is largely increased uh, in the southern hemisphere so pumping up that bottom cell just to make the point that the winds here are not a big player in the in the story so this is the zonal mean, zonal, zonal stress between the 
the, the warm, sorry, I call it interglacial and glacial, the warm and the cold state. And you see that there is very little changes between the two, the two states. So in the, in, the, in the glacial state, you get slightly weaker winds at the peak and slightly shifted to the north. But really, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Ultimately, if you compute the Ekman pumping, it's the same nearly in the two uh, simulations. And uh, uh, that's interesting because it's in contrast to a lot of the literature which has been thinking about how the wind stress over the Southern Ocean might have changed and be the driver of how much the ocean overturning circulation has changed. And we are typically in, a, in, a, in the case here where the winds are not the player, it's the buoyancy change at the surface, the fact that you have a big ice cap which is changing the, the brine rejection. That's what is driving the ocean circulation in that simulation to first order. Oh, sorry. Here? Here? I was thinking it should be like opposite way because the warm water is less, I mean, uh, uh, less denser. So it should not have this stronger, but I mean, you are showing that in the cold state it's weaker, like the North Atlantic deep water itself is. Oh, uh, because the, the cold water should be denser and it should have more stronger, but it is opposite way. It's, it's, it's really the buoyancy loss that matters. It's not whether it's denser in the first place or, or warmer. It's how much, when the water's coming from the tropics into the high latitude, how much buoyancy that it, does it lose? And so I can't remember, you know, you have one of the quarters here. I can't remember what they've done with the buoyancy uh, change in here. But I can tell you about this one because I checked. And the buoyancy loss is indeed a bit larger here than it is here. We did nothing there. You did nothing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the Watson Vallis model, it's not a couple model, right? It's, um, That's right. They, 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 yeah, it's, they describe full yeah. 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 So in your case, there wasn't any buoyancy loss. In, in, no, I mean, in both cases in the north, it was the same buoyancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in our case, it does change. The buoyancy loss does change a bit. But don't we have a stronger, uh, don't we have a stronger North Atlantic cell yeah. in the warm state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you're suggesting. So yeah. It could be because the warm and denser. I mean. No, it's not because the warmer or denser. No. It, actually, the warmer would. It's most would, Oh, it's, ah, okay, I see where you're going, okay. So in that case, it's driven by precipitation. So the buoyancy loss here, uh, though ultimately it has to do with uh, how much heat you release to the atmosphere. And uh, uh, the buoyancy loss here, if I remember correctly, is, is thermally driven. So it's losing more heat here to the atmosphere than it is losing heat here. So but is it because the, the region where the deep water is forming is colder than the warm state? Is that why it's losing more heat? Uh, I can't tell you. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. No. No. It could be figured out. It could be figured out, but we don't know it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I'm not sleeping tonight, and uh, <laughs> you'll get an answer tomorrow. Um, you know, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. I'm go just going to carry on with uh, uh, trying to make the case that those two states have similarities with the present day climate and the last glacial maximum climate. Uh, so here, what I've plotted is the overturning circulation in the small basin. So that's the one, that's the small basin is the one where you have this deep overturning circulation. Uh, so we have something like 15, 20 sverdrops, and when we move in the cold climate, we get 10 sverdrops. So there is a weakening 
of the overturning circulation in the small basin. And also, as you move to the cold climate, you get more water coming from the south, coming into the basin and coming out. So there's a small cell which has gone up from, it was barely a sverdrop here, it's gone up by uh, factor three, so now it's three sverdrops. The point here is that on this side, you have what paleo people are able to extract from observations. So this is a map of delta C13 uh, for the present day climate and for the last glacial maximum. And so what that map is, is saying is that in the present day climate, you see the trace of high delta C13 water being entrained into the Nordic seas and then coming out of the Atlantic at mid depths. So you're reading in this, the overturning circulation like that. And there, there are many caveats with doing that. I should be, you know, be careful. This is just a tracer. It's not, it's not really exactly a transport. But one way to interpret that is that you're reading the overturning circulation in that plot. Now, you have the same plot for the last glacial maximum. And one way to interpret it is that now you see that the water, which have high delta C13, are coming in and leaving maybe at 2,000 meters. So the depth at which those water are coming out has ra uh, risen uh, by 1,000 meters. And then you get more water which are extremely depleted in delta C13. So the hypothesis here is that those water are coming from the southern hemisphere. They, have been, uh, uh, they haven't been exposed much to the, to the atmospheric, uh, to the atmosphere for a while. So it's literally water coming in here and then being entrained in the lower cell and coming in again into the Atlantic in very depleted uh, quantity of uh, delta C13. So in the model, we don't have delta C13, but we have phosphate. And because we have phosphate, we can turn phosphate into a proxy for delta C13. So what I'm plotting here is the delta C13 inferred from our simulation and try to compare it to the delta C13 from observations. Uh, you know, obviously it's not perfect. That's the, uh, we have a square basin, uh, we have a, a flat bottom, but if you look at the numbers, it's pretty amazing. So in our warm state, we have high levels of delta C13 with that peak at the surface being entrained into the North Atlantic water, deep water. And if you look into the cold state, you see First, an increase in delta C13. You see that water coming out at uh, lower depths, shallower depths. And you see those very depleted delta C13 uh, water coming from the southern hemisphere. So whatever is, be, is happening in our model matches very well, at least at the level that we can afford to make that comparison. And it, you, know, you have to be careful with those. This is not overturning, it's just a tracer which is carried by the overturning mixed by eddies uh, and turbulent mixing and so on. So uh, there is no one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's pretty interesting to see how these two match in that simple model. And so the two states looks like the present day climate and the uh, last glacial maximum climate. So an interesting other comparison is uh, if we take those two states and we drive a carbon cycle model with those, so what I mean by that is we take the dynamical state, the currents, the atmosphere, the winds, uh, uh, mixing of the ocean, uh, et cetera, and we drive the carbon cycle in a passive way. So meaning the, carbon, the atmospheric PCO2 is not feeding back on the climate. So it's very, it's very important caveat here. Nonetheless, if we do that, those two systems have a difference in atmospheric PCO2 of about 100 ppm which almost exactly matches the observed change in, uh, in uh, atmospheric CO2 between a glacial and interglacial cycle. So it's quite interesting to think about how CO2 in our couple model has been stored in the deep ocean. So we don't have a land model which is very fancy and, and you know, most people would agree that the difference between PCO2 between, the, sorry, the difference in PCO2 between the, the last glacial maximum and now uh, is due to the fact that CO2 was stored in the ocean. 
CO2 has been pumped up into the, the deep ocean. So how can we, uh, uh, we can analyze that in our simulations? So the change in CO2 in the atmosphere can be decomposed in three, three uh, mechanisms to, to pump it out of the atmosphere into the ocean. So the first one is the, the saturation pump. Essentially what it is that if you have cold water, it can hold more CO2. So as you move from a warm to a cold climate, you just dissolve more CO2 into the ocean and that pumps CO2 out of the atmosphere into the ocean. That's, that's just chemistry. There is a biological pump and that just reflects the fact that at the surface of the ocean, you have phytoplankton growing and as it grows, it, it's taking CO2 to form its body, its cells, and sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Then those phytoplankton, they die, and they fall at the bottom of the ocean, where they can be redissolved into uh, the water. But the net effect of that is that the, that pump is taking CO2 from the top of the ocean down into the bottom of the ocean. So away from a place where it can be dissolved back, sorry, outgassed into the atmosphere. And when you do that, there is a, a third pump, which is the disequilibrium pump, and it, which is very important for our case. What that pump is doing is it's a measure of how much water are equilibrated with the atmospheric PCO2. So you think of uh, water coming at the surface, maybe it's cold, it has some amount of DIC, but it's so cold it could suck up way more DIC out of the atmosphere when it's at the surface. But that parcel will need to remain at the, at, near the surface for long enough to equilibrate with the atmosphere. And the equilibrium time scale for a parcel of water at the surface with the atmosphere is about a year. So many parcels of water on, in the ocean, they, they don't stay for a year at the surface happily equilibrating with the atmosphere. They're going to get sucked back into the ocean on a faster time scale than that. So the water is not always in equilibrium, in a chemical equilibrium with the atmosphere and temperature and salinity. And that's what this is measuring. So if you do that, what you find is that the solubility pump is sucking about 60 ppm out of the atmosphere into the ocean. The biological pump is actually, the change between the two states, I should insist, is equivalent to 36 ppm back into the atmosphere. And the ARC disequilibrium is the big term here. It's accounting for 85 ppm out of the atmosphere into the ocean. So that's the main driver of why the CO2 is lowering in our simulation when you go from a warm to a cold climate. So let me explain why how this is happening. So this is a map of the disequilibrium pump. So it's showing how much waters are not in equilibrium with chemical equilibrium with temperature salinity and the PCO2 of the atmosphere. So that's for the warm climate and that's for the cold climate. So for the warm climate, what you find is that the disequilibrium pump is very small everywhere. And if you go to measure the disequilibrium pump in the present day climate, it is small everywhere. It's a small term. That's the disequilibrium pump in the cold state. And what you f see are big, large values in the Antarctic bottom water cell. So that cell is corresponding, corresponding to a flux which is going around like that. How this happens is that there is an ice extending, ice cap extending almost across the upwelling region of a pruning. So what happens is that water coming to the surface, because they are trapped under sea ice, cannot equilibrate with the atmosphere. So you have cold water which holds a lot of CO2. They come up to the surface, they are under ice, they can't outgas to the atmosphere before being entrained back into the deep ocean. At the same time, you have biological production is still pumping CO2 into the deep ocean. And it doesn't matter whether it changes between the two states, it's always doing that. You always have phytoplankton growing, dying. And so slowly, that, the CO2 content of, that of that, those water is just increasing and storing a lot of CO2 in, uh, in the deep ocean. Uh, uh, that's, that mechanism is actually not new. Uh, 
Stevens and Keeling suggested something along those lines uh, uh, in 2000. But they use a box model to do that. So they had a box model which, so they split the ocean into four or five boxes and just accounted for the flux by uh, uh, maybe in, in a stormwall way. Uh, in our case, this is actually happening in the couple model. So it suggests that that mechanism could survive a more complex type of dynamics than uh, has been suggested. The, the, I should say there are, there are caveats to that. Uh, we do not reproduce all observed features of uh, the last glacial maximum, and there is one which is a big, a big issue for us, is that there are suggestions that the oxygen content of deep waters was actually lower at the last glacial maximum than it is now. And we have exactly the opposite. And that's probably because in our model, we, we are missing some of the process, uh, and, and possibly we are missing something like iron cycling and so on. But uh, uh, nonetheless, if you start to make a list of the diff what, what do we know about differences between the last glacial maximum and now, and you put that against a list of the differences, between, the differences between the warm and the cold climate we have in the model. Uh, there is a list which is, uh, so that's, I made the list. So if you think, for example, of deep ocean temperature, clearly the system uh, was colder at the last glacial maximum. The range is two to four degrees Celsius estimates. We have 7.7, .7, so it's a bit too large, but it's in the bulk uh, number. It's the right order of magnitude. The salinity estimates are that at the last glacial maximum, deep water were probably one or two PSU saltier. And there is a reason for that, that we can't reprodu reproduce that number, is that most of the reason why the, P the salinity of the ocean was larger at the last glacial maximum is that you, we took water and we put it over land. And so just the, the whole ocean got saltier on average. And we don't have that, that effect. Uh, an interesting one is that the sea ice extent in the southern hemisphere is estimated to be shifting by about 10, 5 to 10 degrees of latitude in observations, and we get about 13 degrees of latitude. And the reason why that number is important is that it's what is driving the, the PCO2 storage into the deep ocean. The sea ice extends in the cold state right above the regions of upwelling. That's why water coming from the deep ocean to the surface can't outgas. It's because you have that sea ice cap, which is preventing water to <coughs> equilibrate with the atmosphere. Uh, so PCO2 is uh, in the right range with the caveat that we don't have an active, radiatively active PCO2. And uh, we have interesting things like the, the depth of the AMOC is also changing the right direction. And as I mentioned, the deep oxygen is a big, we, are, we just don't get the right sign there. The point of that is, is they look kind of similar. They are, and when you think about the, 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 the lack of complexity of our coupled uh, climate simulation, it's quite amazing that we can reproduce so many features of the last glacial maximum. And so we are trying to make the case that maybe we should think about glacial interglacial cycle as being representative of multiple states of climate. There are many tick marks there that seems to suggest that those two states could be multiple states. And if you go that way, uh, oops, sup, sup. I'm not going to go a lot into the stochastic resonance. I just want to make the point that uh, when people look at the paleoclimate record, so that's various paleoproxies that people have, and those are time series of the orbital parameters, the mean and Kovic cycles, and we know that the precession is varying with a, a 20,000 uh, time scale periodicity, obliquity is 40,000, <coughs> and eccentricity is 100,000. And those three periodicities, we find them in the paleoclimate record. <coughs> That's been established for a long time and uh, by this uh, Hayes paper in the 70s, 
And a few years ago, there was a, a, a small review article in Nature uh, celebrating this achievement of being able to make the link between the paleo climate oscillations of the last the, the glacial interglacial cycle and the link with uh, uh, the orbital parameters. But the interesting fact is that uh, despite those 30 plus 40 years, uh, whatever happens between those oscillations and the response of the climate system, we still don't have an answer to that. Uh, and that's very neat symbol here of having wheels which are turning in various directions and uh, uh, we still haven't figured out a mechanism where we go from there to there. We do have statistical robust evidence that the glacial, uh, the, sorry, the Milenkovic cycles are seen in the glacial interglacial uh, in the paleoclimate record. We don't know why. And uh, I just want to point out that Again, if you look at the literature, there are a bit of uh, a two-family type of, uh, uh, of view of the problem. Uh, there is a linear view, which is we know the, the oscillations of the incoming solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere from Milankovic. And from there, we have a response of the climate and maybe some very strong feedback because we know that the forcing at the top of the atmosphere is due to Milankovic is not that large. Especially if you start to integrate across hemispheres, it's actually almost zero. <coughs> Effectively, in many cases, it's exactly zero if you integrate globally. So why is it that the climate system would respond to the incoming solar radiation at 65 north and would not care about the exact opposite forcing at 10 north. But people have been focusing on this. So usually the, the way to go around that is to think about feedbacks. Why is it that the forcing at the top uh, at 65 north is so important, way more important than the one in the tropics? It's not obvious. And CO2 ice sheet and sea ice are usually the, the top of the list uh, uh, feedbacks you, you think about, at least what proposed in the literature is the high latitudes are really important because that's where all those feedbacks are <coughs> acting. But essentially, it's a linear view. There is a forcing, and then uh, it changes something in the system, and then the system responds by a positive feedback, making the, the response to the forcing even larger, and then you drag the system from point A to point B. And then there is the nonlinear view, which is the one we are trying to, to push forward, is that you think about that double well, and you have those coexisting states. And now the question is not how you go from one well to the other, but how do you go from one well to above the hump? And so it's a very different type of, of dynamics. And uh, clearly this is, I would say, the preeminent view in the literature. There has been lots of work along those lines, but really what's a lot of, of that was done with very simple model, and we are slowly getting onto the, uh, the trail of thinking that maybe we should be pushing a bit harder in that direction with more complex models. David? Yes? Your two states seem to be further apart than in reality. Yeah. And, I mean, you're minus seven cold or something like that. Your cold state is seven degrees colder. Or yeah, like yeah. Now, in fact, that is with a radiation stream which is not responding to the CO2. So if you actually reduce the CO2 down to what man's in, your state will probably be about uh, 12 degrees colder. So it would be a lot colder than... Actually, we did that experiment. It's, ju it's just a few degrees colder. The, the issue is that we know why the separation is too large, and it's actually a bias in the warm state. The warm state is too warm. It's not the cold state, which is too cold. Uh, and it's too warm because the North Atlantic deep water is too warm. And it's too warm <laughs> because we don't have Canada. Canada is the, the cause of... <laughs> Brian is looking at me weirdly. What? <laughs> no, we don't, we don't have... A, I think what we are missing is that we don't have those cold, dry outbreaks over deep convection zones of deep. Uh, sink of the 
right yeah, and so we don't produce those three degrees Celsius deep water that we, we should be producing. But it's, it is an issue, yeah, it is an issue. Okay, almost done, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, I just want a, a brief plug, which has nothing to do with multiple states, but uh, 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 we've been doing some work with uh, high obliquity, uh, playing with those aqua planets and looking at the high obliquity uh, case, and, and looking at the, um, and th the reason I'm, I'm, I'm just bragging about it is that uh, uh, we just got a citation in the New York Times, woo! <laughs> two days ago, but uh, uh, people were interested in why could we have life being sustained in a high obliquity world, and uh, uh, the, answer, the answer is yes, because there is an ocean, and uh, uh, I'm not gonna go further into that. And just a fun, a fun movie, that's actually another case of a tidally locked planet. So that's a planet which is always which is turning on itself at the same rate as it's turning around the sun. So it's always showing the same face to the sun. So there's a face which is always day and a face which is always night. And so we did a coupled simulation of that with uh, so the, the same system, coupled ocean atmosphere. Uh, so the fun stuff is that you can change the rotation rate in, in that model and obviously if you have a one day uh, rotation rate, which is our present day type of rotation rate, the ocean is not area resolving because the Resby radius is about 30 kilometers and we have a grid <laughs> cell of 300. But you know, you can be do doing some cheating there. You just increase the rotation rate to 20 days. So because the Resby radius is NH over F, and F now is, is way smaller, the Rosby radius goes up. So now we have, in that simulation, we have a Rosby radius of, of a few thousand kilometers, and we have an ED resolving ocean at a three degree resolution. But what's really fun is that if you look at, uh, uh, oops, is it going? Uh, is that the ED resolving ocean is able to carry a lot of heat from the, the, the warm side to the cold side. So there is way less sea ice on the cold side of that ocean which is ADR resolving. Uh, but now if you look at the atmosphere, when you have a one day uh, rotation rate, what you see is that uh, you can see synoptic scale EDs in the atmosphere, normal, the atmosphere is ADR resolving uh, at that resolution. If you go really slow, now the, the AD seems to disappear and we only have convection. Again, if you put numbers, the, the Rosby radius is, is 1,000 here, so now it's 20,000. It doesn't fit anymore into the, the hemisphere. So we just have a convective atmosphere sitting on top of an AD resolving ocean. And here we have an AD resolving atmosphere sitting over a, a parameterized ocean. Uh, it's just fun. And conclusion, so uh, really. It means that your planet has to orbit the star in 20 days. Yeah, yeah, days. yeah, yeah. And so if effectively, because of Kepler's law, it should be further away. Uh, no, closer. you have closer, sorry, it should be closer, yeah. But we did not change the solar constant to make, you know, to make the comparison. Uh, but in, in, in theory, it, the, the, the rotation around should go with the distance, yeah. Yeah. Okay, just to summarize. Uh, okay. I just want to ask from the uh, previous slide, why, why, is the, uh, why does the ice cap on the cold side of the world have these sort of chain intrusions? Why, why is the ice? Oh, this here? Yeah, like on the one above, there's that dip. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just the currents. The, 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 uh, you have jets in the ocean which are going one way or the other. So uh, there's a system of alternating jets. And at the equator, it's westward. No, sorry, eastward. And uh, they are uh, off the equator, they are westward. And so that, that's just bringing heat uh, or, uh, yeah.
and then here it's strong enough to just melt away the whole. Uh, okay, summary. Uh, really, what we, we just want to point out is that when we think about multiple states, uh, uh, I think there is obviously a huge literature which has been emphasizing the AMOC based stability. And what we are thinking is that maybe we think, think more about ocean, ice, multiple state, and, and in, uh, uh, instabilities. And as pointed out yesterday at the end of uh, Brian's talk is that there has been lots of uh, efforts into studying the AMOC by stability. There hasn't been anything near which has been done for the multiple state of the sea ice albedo type. And uh, uh, maybe we should be doing that more often. OK? Uh, have you watched the uh, sunset last week? Last week? Uh, last night? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Kelvin Helmholtz. Yeah. Instabilities. Yeah. Really? Questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh. we, uh, Sorry. Several years ago, uh, we, uh, with uh, uh, Ricardo and with my students, uh, we did a similar experimentation with a large basin versus small basin with constant. Yeah. And we did a large effort to reproduce, to reproduce your, uh, I mean, without constant, yeah. large basin versus uh, small basin. We had a uh, I mean, uh, difficulty to reproduce uh, your results. OK. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, also uh, need a constant. With the continent, we uh, made uh, many experimentation with uh, river discharge. How river uh, goes this way and this way, and uh, we made so many experimentation. And uh, and and finally, I mean, the river discharge it doesn't uh, doesn't make how much uh, uh, much change. But uh, uh, the Albedo, yep. Albedo uh, this uh, simulation was very sensitive to uh, Albedo, yep. particularly uh, in. Tropical uh, content time. You know? Okay. Yeah. So uh, we don't we, we we don't know how to control this. So then we gave up. Okay. Two years ago. So, you shouldn't. Huh? You should not. I shouldn't. That's why I said uh, uh, we need uh, to 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 exchange, and uh, we, uh, we 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 have to. I mean, <coughs> your simulation could be by luck, and uh, uh, my simulation. No. By, no I'm by, kidding. By, huh? No, no. Bad luck. <laughs> bad luck. Yeah, bad luck. Good luck. Huh? Good luck. <laughs> Maybe yes. So uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how I mean, how you prescribe uh, albedo in your case. Content albedo. I I put a number. A number. One number, yeah. I think it's point one, which is something like a forest. Okay, and I, point oh six. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I would have to check. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our system is sensitive to the albedo choice. It's definitely sensitive to the albedo choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it is sensitive, yeah. But aren't we using the same atmospheric physics? I don't know. I think we are both using are we? Uh, atmospheric physics, aren't we? The physics, yes. Physics? Our, our case? No, yeah. physics is. Oh, your model. Yeah, our model. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, and, uh, okay. So it's the okay. Ah, okay. So, uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's quite completely different. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we should we should coordinate something. Yeah, yeah. We should yeah we should figure out if there is some obvious uh, way to go. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. There is no El Nino. Uh, I can't. <laughs> we had that same discussion. Yeah, I think there is no El Nino. Uh, I remember checking, but uh, uh, there is not. No. Actually, uh, there is probably too little variability in the system, if anything, uh, because theory would tell you that there should be some spontaneous transition from time to time, and we don't see any. So maybe it's a sign, but uh, no, we don't have any new. Is that a problem for like assessing the 
Well, uh, so I, I skipped the stochastic resonance part, but uh, uh, for any noise into the system, you, you could compute a, a probability of transition. Uh, ours is clearly larger than multi-thousand years. I don't know what should be the real number. That's, that's, so uh, we, could, we could add noise, and uh, we could add noise to the point where we see transitions, definitely. But uh, I, I don't know what's, you know, what's a, a good, uh, we could use observation, I guess, to, uh, to gauge how far we are off the mark. Yeah. 